let us uh, consider for the TE case. Okay. So here the electric field is along the x direction. In this case, the electric field is along the x direction. So incident wave, uh, for the incident wave, the electric field component of the incident wave, I denotes the incident wave, can be written as x is the unit vector. This denotes that the electric field for this uh, incident wave is in the x direction. Okay, it is uh, given by this expression. This we've already seen. And for the reflected wave, again the reflected wave also, uh, it is along the uh, it is along the uh, x direction. Now the amplitude is simply e zero prime. Okay, and uh, here this is minus k y cos theta. Okay, so now by principle of superposition, the net electric field component in the region between the conducting planes will simply be the addition of the uh, incident wave and the reflected wave. So we simply add the two field components. So the net wave is now simply the superposition of the incident wave and reflected wave. Now according to the boundary condition, what does the boundary condition say? The boundary condition says that E tangential is equal to 0. So according to the boundary conditions, the tangential component of electric field must be 0 at the surface of the conducting plane. Now electric field is in this direction, okay, and this, so that means at this boundary, it is which component? It is the tangential component, okay. So it has to be 0 at y is equal to 0, okay. Similarly, at, uh, at the surface of this conductor, the electric field is again tangential component. So it has to be 0. So what is the boundary condition? The boundary condition will be that the electric field is 0 at y is equal to 0 and y is equal to a. So to this uh, resultant electric field, let us now apply the first boundary condition that e is equal to 0 at y is equal to 0. So we put e is equal to 0 at y is equal to 0. Okay. So we get, this is what we get. Now this equation is satisfied for all z and all t if e0 plus e0 prime is equal to 0 or in other words e0 is equal to minus e0 prime. Okay, so this simply implies that at uh, when the incident wave goes and it gets reflected, it just suffers a phase change of pi, pi. there is no change in the amplitude. Okay, so this is just telling you that. So we can substitute uh, instead of E0 prime, we can substitute E0 and uh, write the expression for the electric field again. So this is what we get. Now we can simplify this. So uh, this we can, you know that E to the power of uh, Jx is simply sin x plus J cos x. So expanding by using this expression, expanding both uh, for this and this and simplifying, we get the unit vector x because the electric field is in the x direction 2 times j e0 and then sin ky cos theta e j kz sin theta minus omega t. So this, this remains and this is now simplified to sin ky cos theta. Okay, so again uh, you can write it in uh, this form, k can be written as omega by c as well, where omega is the uh, uh, frequency in free space. <coughs> so now we, here we can put this k into cos theta as kc and k into sin theta as kg and we can write this expression here. So we have the expression for the electric field as, uh, so this is the amplitude and this is the uh, propagation part. Okay, so what does this represent now? This represents a wave now which is traveling in the z direction. So this wave is now traveling only in the z direction with a propagation constant kc, sorry kg. Okay, the propagation constant has also changed and having a sinusoidal variation in the y direction. Okay, So the amplitude is now earlier uh, when it was in free space the amplitude was just E0. Now the amplitude has a sinusoidal variation in y and remember y is the direction in which the boundary was applied. 
so standing wave is now formed in the y direction okay so <clears throat> So for this expression, uh, this represents a wave propagating in the z direction with a propagation constant kg. Okay, so kg is now 2 pi by lambda g. So lambda g is the new wavelength of the propagating wave. Okay, the uh, uh, when it was propagating in free space, the wavelength was lambda. Now the wavelength has also changed to lambda g. And this is equal to omega by c sin theta as we have seen from the previous uh, slide. So lambda g can be written as lambda 0 by sin theta. So lambda 0 is uh, the free space wavelength and lambda g is called the guided wavelength. That means the wavelength which is inside the conducting uh, in the region bounded by the conducting boundaries. <clears throat> and similarly uh, this wave is now it does not have a constant amplitude. It is the amplitude is varying sinusoidally along the y-axis with an effective wavelength lambda c, okay, which is given by kc is equal to 2 pi by lambda c. So earlier the amplitude in the uh, uh, the amplitude in the uh, free space it was constant, and now the amplitude has a sinusoidal variation, okay, which is given by 2 pi by lambda c. This is to satisfy the boundary condition. So lambda c can be written as lambda 0 by cos theta and lambda c is the cutoff wavelength. Now from these two expressions, if we uh, eliminate theta, so sin square theta plus cos square theta is equal to 1, we get an expression between lambda 0, lambda c and lambda g. So lambda 0 is the wavelength of the wave in free space, lambda g is the wavelength in the uh, region between the conducting boundary. So once it is entering the region uh, bounded by the conducting boundaries, it is moving with a different wavelength or a different propagation constant. So that is lambda g. And lambda c is the wavelength of the standing wave that is formed in the direction in which the boundary has been applied. Now let's apply the second boundary condition. The second boundary condition is the electric field is 0 and y is equal to a. Okay, so uh, let's apply the condition. This is 0 and uh, y is equal to a. So this equation is satisfied for all z and t if sine of ka cos theta is equal to 0 or in other words ka cos theta is equal to n pi where n is an integer. So k can be written as omega by c a cos theta can be written as lambda 0 by lambda c from the previous slide. So this is equal to n pi. So here lambda 0 gets cancelled with omega by c and we are left with lambda c is equal to 2a by n. So you see that lambda c is the wavelength of the standing wave formed in the y direction that is the direction in which the boundaries have been applied and it depends upon the dimension of the system. So this is analogous to the case of the string. Okay, so there we saw that the frequency or the wavelength of the fundamental mode depends only on the dimensions of the system and the disturbance of the, the dependence of the disturbance on y, it cannot have any arbitrary wavelength but only an infinite set of discrete wavelengths. Why? Because n is an integer. So it cannot have now any arbitrary wavelength but only an infinite set of discrete Variance. So in between the two infinite parallel conductors, in order to satisfy the boundary conditions, the field uh, arranges themselves to form certain uh, patterns of the standing wave. So here uh, if n is equal to 1, this is the TE1 uh, mode. So this is the y direction in which the boundary has been applied and this is the z direction in which there is no boundary and the wave is propagating in this, di uh, in this direction. So we see that a standing wave is formed in the y direction, the direction in which boundary is applied. So this is the first mode and uh, if you put n is equal to 1 here, we have lambda c is equal to 2a. So this is the length uh, from 0 to a. So we get here uh, a is equal to lambda c by 2. This wave, this uh, wave which is propagating in this direction, if we calculate or if we see its wavelength in this direction, this corresponds to lambda g which is the wavelength of the guided wave. 
Similarly, for n is equal to 2, we have two half period variations in the field in the y direction, the direction in which the fields have been applied. So, you can see from here that there is uh, this field, field is 0 here, again it is 0 here and in between it goes to 0. So, if I plot in y the variation of the field from 0 to a, I have 0 here maximum going to maximum and then in the opposite direction. So at, uh, at A again it is equal to 0 to satisfy the boundary condition. This wave is again propagating in the z direction and this is the guided wavelength which uh, corresponds to the wavelength of the guided wave. So you can see this here. So this is the y direction. In the y direction it is a standing wave. So if you can see at any point here, so here the electric field amplitude is always 0. Okay, and at this point here, just like the case of the string, okay, the, this is the first mode. So, uh, the amplitude at these points is 0 and at this point it is oscillating from minus A to A. Okay, whereas in the Z direction, so this is the Y direction, whereas in the Z direction it is a propagating wave and this wavelength corresponds to lambda G. This is the second mode. So, in the second mode, the uh, wavelength, uh, so we have two half period variations of the wavelength. So, here it is uh, 0, here it is 0 and again in between it is 0. So, it will be something like this, analogous to the case of the string. So now let us see the difference between the electromagnetic wave in free space and the electromagnetic uh, wave in between two parallel conducting planes. In free space, this was the form of the uh, electromagnetic wave, the electric field component of the electromagnetic wave, the amplitude was constant and it was, uh, uh, in this case, it was propagating in both the y direction and the z direction. So the amplitude was constant and it was propagating in both the y direction and z direction. Okay, so it was in the yz plane. Now, when we applied boundaries, what happened was that the, uh, res the resultant wave has a form like this. So now it is propagating with a new propagation constant. Here the propagation constant was k. Now it is propagating with a new propagation constant kg and it is propagating only in the z direction. It is no longer propagating in the y direction and y is the direction in which the boundaries were applied. So in the y direction, it has uh, formed a standing wave. So there, so you can see that in the amplitude, there is a sinusoidal variation in the y direction. Okay, so wave is no longer propagating in the y direction because it is a direction in which the boundaries have now been applied. Coming back to this expression for uh, lambda zero, which is the wavelength in free space, lambda c which is the wavelength of the standing wave. So c here denotes the uh, cutoff, uh, uh, cutoff wavelength and uh, lambda g this is the wavelength of, uh, of the wave that is now propagating inside the system of uh, infinite parallel conductors. Now for a given system lambda c is constant because lambda c depends only on the dimensions of the system so lambda c is constant. Now, as lambda 0 is increased, lambda g also increases and the phase velocity, that means the velocity with which the uh, wave is propagating in the, uh, in the uh, region between the parallel conductors, this is also going to increase until lambda 0 becomes equal to lambda c. So, as uh, lambda 0 is increased, lambda g also increases. Now when lambda 0 becomes equal to lambda c, what happens is that lambda g and vg both become imaginary. So the wave now gets attenuated. So any wavelength, any lambda 0 greater than lambda c will not be able to be propagated inside the system. It will get attenuated. It will not enter inside this system. So the free space wavelength at which the disturbance changes from being propagated to attenuated. This is known as the cutoff wavelength. Okay. In terms of frequency, since frequency and wavelength are uh, inversely uh, related, in terms of uh, frequency if you do it, so you will find that 
uh, waves below the cutoff frequency are attenuated and above the cutoff frequency are propagated. So the corresponding frequency here is called the cutoff frequency. The subscript C denotes the cutoff. So here let me just summarize the uh, field patterns in the TE mode. So this is the TE1 mode, this is the TE2 mode. So here in the Y direction a standing, a standing wave is formed. So if we see the TE1 mode, there is one half period variation in the Y direction from 0 to A. And if we see the uh, TE2 mode, there are two half period variations or one full period variation of the standing wave in the y direction. So this is from 0 to A and the wave is a propagating wave in the z direction and um, this, corres this corresponds to lambda c, this wavelength here corresponds to lambda c and here n will take value 1, here n will take value 2 and this corresponds to the guided wavelength. So, uh, in the direction in which the wave is propagating. Similarly, we can uh, do the entire calculation for the TM mode and we will get similar results. So, here uh, for the TM mode, the magnetic field is in the X direction. Okay. So, here uh, at the boundaries, this magnetic field is the tangential component. In both cases, the magnetic field is the tangential component and tangential component of magnetic field is it need not be equal to 0. So the boundary condition is that the normal component of magnetic field is 0. So in this case uh, for the first mode we will have so we, we will not have magnetic field equal to 0 here and here. So we will have uh, but still we need to have one half period variation. So we can have so we can have one half period variation from here to here. So you will see the field is maximum here, the field is maximum here and then it goes to 0, it goes to 0 here and then again it is maximum in the opposite direction here. Okay, So this is the magnetic field along y, and this again is the z direction, this corresponds to lambda g. This is a TM2 mode, here you have one, uh, we have two half period variations along y. So the field is varying from here to here. So, so we have the field here as, uh, so let's say at this point, the field here is maximum, then it goes to 0 at this point, then it is maximum in the opposite direction here, and then again it goes to 0, and then again it goes in the positive direction. Okay, and then similarly we can have TM3, TM4 modes and so on. Uh, so this was like a waveguide in one dimension. So a waveguide is generally a hollow uh, hollow pipe of infinite extent. So that means now here we had in this case we had applied the boundary only in one direction. So if we applied boundaries in both the directions now let's say x and y and the wave is free to propagate in the z direction. So then uh, uh, we will have a standing wave in both the x and y direction. So such a system is known as a waveguide. So waveguide is a hollow pipe of infinite extent. So let's consider the propagation of electromagnetic waves along a hollow pipe of uh, arbitrary cross section in the xy plane. So it has some arbitrary cross section in the xy plane okay, and uniform along the length. So this is a waveguide of arbitrary cross section. Now each component of E and B the electric field and magnetic field must satisfy the wave equation in vacuum which is given by this. So the wave equation is uh, del square E minus mu 0 epsilon 0 del 2 E by del T square is equal to 0 or del 2, uh, del 2 E. So this mu 0 epsilon 0 can be written as 1 by C square. So you can write it as this as this and similarly for the magnetic field you can write it as this. Now, in addition, to satis uh, in addition to satisfying the wave equation inside this, the, it should also satisfy the boundary conditions. Okay? The boundary, what are the boundary conditions? The tangential component of electric field is 0 at the boundary and the normal component of magnetic field is 0 at the boundary. Okay? And uh, intuitively from what we have uh, done in the one dimension, we can write that now since boundaries are applied in the x and y direction. So now the amplitude will have a sinusoidal variation in both x and y. 
okay it will have some variation in both x and y direction okay so in the one dimension case since the boundary was applied only in the y direction the amplitude had a uh, sinusoidal variation in the y direction now since the boundaries are applied in both x and y direction and free to propagate in the z direction so the amplitude will have uh, some variation in x and y so it will form a standing wave in the x direction and y direction and it will propagate in the z direction with a propagation constant kg so uh, putting the second equation in uh, the first equation in the wave equation we get for electric field del 2 e by del x, uh, del x square plus del 2 e by del y square minus kg square e plus omega square by c square e is equal to 0 we take this quantity in bracket okay and this we know that is equal to kc square okay where kc is what it is the uh, it is the wavelength uh, or the wave number of the standing wave pattern okay formed in the direction in which the boundaries have been applied so and uh, this is uh, derivative double derivative with respect to the transverse component so we can uh, represent it as del perpendicular square okay similarly for the magnetic field also by putting the form of magnetic field in that expression uh, wave equation we uh, get a similar expression and the two expressions can be combined uh, and written like this now maxwell's equation in free space r curl of e is equal to minus del b by del t okay so this can be evaluated we can uh, so we can write this as del by del x del by del y del by del z okay e x e y e z is equal to minus del b by del t and b also you can expand in terms of components b x uh, b y and b z okay so if you okay so if you now just uh, equate the terms on the left hand side and right hand side the x component y component and z component you will get three sets of equations here okay so uh, the x component is del e z by del y minus del e y by del z is equal to minus del b x by del t and similarly for the y and z components okay and uh, also using this expression for curl of p is equal to 1 by c square del e by del t we will get again three sets of equations here okay now the both electric field and magnetic field have a form like this so if we uh, take the partial derivative of uh, this with respect to z we will get i into kj and if we take partial derivative of uh, the electric field or magnetic field with respect to t we will get minus i omega so everywhere substituting del by del z with i kg okay so we substitute del by del z with i k g and del by del t with minus i omega also here so we arrive at these sets of uh, equations so these sets of uh, equations uh, we can now rearrange and simplify so we get e x e y we get expressions for e x e y b x and b y so now we notice that all the four transverse components okay so e e x e y b x b y all the four transverse components they can be written in terms of the uh, z components e z and b z only so notice that in all the four cases e x e y b x b y they can all be written in terms of just e z and b z so that means that inside a waveguide we need to know just ez and bz okay if we know ez and uh, bz then we know all the then we know all the six components of the field because ex ey bx by can be derived from ez and bz 
so uh, from here we can conclude that it is sufficient to determine ez and bz as the solutions of the two dimensional wave equation other transverse components can then be calculated from the above equation okay so now uh, notice from here that tem waves cannot propagate in a wave guide as if you have ez is equal to B 0 and bz is equal to 0 so if you have ez is equal to 0 and bz is equal to 0 okay so what does it mean so you have ez equal to 0 bz equal to 0 so since all the other fields depend upon ez and bz we will have ex equal to 0 ey equal to 0 bx equal to 0 and by equal to 0 so that means all field components will go to 0 and we will not have any field at all okay so this implies all fields are zero and no more so that means tem modes cannot propagate in a wave guide so electromagnetic waves in free space are tem modes when they enter inside the wave guide they propagate either as tm mode or te mode they cannot propagate as tem mode okay because they have to satisfy the boundary conditions in tm mode the magnetic field is transverse to the direction of propagation so bz is equal to 0 okay and te mode electric field is transverse to the direction of propagation so ez is equal to 0 so you can have two modes of propagation the tm mode and the ee mode so let me summarize uh, whatever we have done in this lecture so we have seen that electromagnetic waves in free space are tem waves propagating with a propagation constant k and velocity c but they cannot be used for acceleration so they have a time varying component of electric field but this electric field is always uh, perpendicular to the direction of the velocity of the beam so it cannot be used for acceleration now when electromagnetic waves propagate in region bounded by conducting boundaries they form a standing wave which is uh, known as modes okay in the direction in which the boundaries are applied the amplitude has a sinusoidal variation in the direction the boundaries are applied in order to satisfy the boundary conditions so the standing wave is formed in order to satisfy the boundary conditions at the boundary the wavelength of the standing wave depends upon the dimensions of the system so in the direction in which there is no boundary the electromagnetic wave is a propagating wave with a new propagation constant kg okay so uh, with this we have learned today about the propagation of electromagnetic waves in uh, uh, in between conducting boundaries so how they rearrange themselves they change from a tem wave to a tm or te wave in order to satisfy the boundary condition and how they form modes or uh, standing wave field patterns in the direction in which the boundary has been applied in the next uh, lecture we'll see electromagnetic waves in wave guides and cavity so in wave guides we will apply the boundaries in two directions and in cavities now finally we will apply the boundaries in all the three directions and then we will see that uh, how modes are formed and how these modes can be used for acceleration of charged particles as proposed by uh, alvarez